Hi, I'm Dr. Travis Thurston, and I'm here for the next installment of the Remote Teaching and Learning Analytics web series. I'm excited to be here today. Uh, this is a partnership between the Center for Student Analytics and also the Office of Empowering Teaching Excellence at Utah State University. I'm the Assistant Director in the Office of Empowering Teaching Excellence, and today we're going to be talking about leveraging instructional services to optimize remote teaching. Now, before we get started too much, I want to point out uh, down below my name, uh, there's that little blue bird icon uh, for Twitter there. Uh, you can connect with me there on Twitter, but I, I've added this element into the, the webinar today where uh, kind of an Easter egg, or if you're not familiar with, with gamification terms, it's kind of this little hidden bonus throughout the presentation. So what you should be looking for are uh, these little icons with the handle, the at, for example, mine is at travesty328. And these are individuals uh, who I've connected with on Twitter to build my own professional learning network and who I would recommend you to connect with as well. Uh, I've also added those in uh, from, from sources and from information that I've learned and gained from these individuals. So I hope this, is, this will be a good experience. Uh, recently, I've been reading uh, this book from Kevin Gannon called Radical Hope, A Teaching Manifesto. And one of the things that really stands out to me is the author points out to us that the act of teaching, the act of teaching itself, uh, is a radical act of hope. And, and I really love the way that he frames the importance and, and really the effort that goes into teaching uh, individuals and I just want to take a moment to thank all of you if you're if you're spending the time right now to watch a webinar on remote teaching during all of, of the the sad and scary things that are going on in the world uh, that are keeping us busy and, and changing our routines I am I'm so happy that you're taking the time to do this these times are hard and, and what we do in teaching is difficult but the reason we're here is because we care about our students. And the reason we care about improving teaching is because we, we want our students to be successful and we care about their futures. One of the things that he points out in this book uh, later on is that when students see themselves as not just the recipients of content, but as knowledge producers or as architects of their own learning, then they reap the full benefits of higher education. I love that. That really points out this idea of autonomy and giving students choice and giving them the benefits of participating uh, in an educational experience in higher ed. We're here to help our students and we want to help them uh, to be successful. So as we're doing that, and as I go through this webinar today, a, a lot of what we're talking about is foundational in the community of inquiry framework. And this framework gives us a perspective on what we do in the classroom. And it starts with these three main aspects. So cognitive presence is this idea that uh, we as instructors identify content. So you'll see some of that in the webinar where we're identifying content or creating content uh, to share with our students. Next is teaching presence. This is the, the structure and process that we go through in teaching. Uh, these are things like uh, the norms that we develop and that we establish for our classroom, the process uh, of uh, submitting assignments and the way that I give feedback as an instructor, things of that nature. And then the social presence aspect uh, is really where we talk about interaction, the interactions that we have between instructors and students and the interactions that we have between students. We're also going to hit on this idea uh, throughout the webinar of flattening the walls of the classroom. This really can be done well in a remote teaching or online teaching uh, format because we can use the world as our classroom. As we're thinking about this remote teaching, uh, there was a great article I read recently about when we're teaching using, uh, whether it's Zoom or WebEx or some of these uh, video conferencing apps, 
there are ways that we can still be inclusive in our approach to help students f feel involved and feel that they're welcome um, in that classroom. And, and first and foremost is being aware of the hidden curriculum that's inherent in the way that we're teaching in these formats. Uh, there are certain norms uh, that we are maybe familiar with, that, but perhaps our students are not. For example, when we, when we join a webinar or we join a, a live session, uh, we should have our, our mic muted, right? That's something that we've kind of established as a norm or a best practice, but it, it's not necessarily obvious to everyone who's, who's participating. So make sure that you share some of those things that you want to establish as norms, and maybe also think of how your students can help you establish some of those norms for your own classroom. Another thing that you can encourage uh, with your students is to list their name as their username or the name in which they would like to be addressed. Uh, when they're in that session so that you can see it there on the screen uh, and it helps us to use each other's names as we're conversing and and kind of secondary to that it's this idea of speaking up so when we do all have our our mics muted sometimes there's a, a lag in a question uh, that you offer as the instructor and and how quickly the students respond so remember that when you do ask a question pause maybe just a little bit longer than you than you perhaps would in a traditional face-to-face -face classroom. Give students an opportunity to speak up. There's also little features in a lot of these. You know, they can click to, to virtually raise their hand, or you can also use uh, the chat feature. So allowing another channel for individuals to, to communicate and, and share comments and things like that can really help. And just reminding everyone in the classroom that we are in this together. We're working together. We want to be inclusive. We want to be able to, to help each other learn and grow. And that's really vital. Al along with that, the names, uh, you can also encourage students to, to list their preferred pronouns as part of their username on the screen. And that's another way that we can then be inclusive and, and share uh, in this experience together. Now, having said that, there was actually a fantastic article from the Chronicle on Higher Education talking about all of these synchronous live video meetings are getting us zoomed out, right? We're, we're doing so many of these meetings and, and is this really the best way uh, to communicate and, and to teach our classes? And, and I, would, I would argue that there are perhaps better ways that we can do that. Uh, Asynchronous teaching is, is what we would call that, or sometimes called low bandwidth teaching or uh, anytime teaching. I'll refer to it as, as anytime teaching today uh, in this webinar. But, but really what that means is we're not having a set time where we're all getting together to meet for class. We're giving students the opportunity to learn uh, at their own pace and what fits into their own schedule. Next, when we talk about uh, this anytime teaching, a lot of times uh, we get carried away with the, the design and, and the intentional aspects that we've created for the course. And so uh, my colleague, Dr. Mitchell Culver, talks about uh, this creation of our classroom as a box. Right? We create this nice box of a classroom. And, and sometimes we forget that it's students being present in the box should change the box, right? The fact that we have humans interacting within that box changes the box. That means that we need to remember to include our student perspectives, allow them to have some choice and flexibility uh, within that box. That's certainly key. And then as we're creating these, these learning experiences, as we're creating these interactions, we want to remember that it should be socially constructive in nature, meaning that when we engage in that social presence aspect of the class as the instructor, we're trying to encourage and guide students in discourse so that they can work together to co-construct that knowledge. They can co-construct meaning. They can find value in, in the content and in the experience of the class as we're working together. Now you're probably thinking, great, Travis, that all sounds fantastic, but how in the world do I have the time to actually pull that off? I'm just one person, right? 
So today I'm going to advocate for four professionals that you should be collaborating with to really optimize this remote teaching. We don't expect you to do this on your, on your own. We, we don't. And there are plenty of people here to help. Uh, along with those four professionals that I'm going to be talking about, I'm also going to share some of the things that they have taught me and some of the takeaways that I've had. So not only am I going to be talking about some of the, the services and, and the collaborations you can have, but also some of the actual uh, physical things, whether it's the cognitive presence, the, the materials and the content for your course, the teaching process, some of the ways that you're going to intentionally plan learning experiences with your students, and then also some of that social presence of how you're going to be interacting with your students and ways you can encourage students to interact uh, with each other. So number one on our list is librarians. There are so many different types of librarians, subject matter, research, e-learning librarians. We have so many fantastic professionals available to help us in our teaching. One of the things that they have been pointing out recently uh, on their social media channels is that they have OER available. OER are open educational resources. These can be textbooks, they can actually be modules that you can place into your, your course if you're using Canvas. Uh, uh, even full courses, uh, not just modules. And of course assignments and things like that. Also included in, in OER are streaming videos and movies. All sorts of existing content that, that you can utilize on your own, um, in your own course. And our librarians are there to help us to, to find these resources and to match what we're trying to do in our class and the topics of our class uh, into, into the classroom, match us with, with what exists in some of these databases. So some examples are, are OpenStax or the MIT OpenCourseWare or Merlot that has lots of great videos. We also have LibGuides available through the library. They're organized by subjects and disciplines. There's, there's research help. There are specific uh, LibGuides about uh, how to stream videos from the library or even how to access eBooks. So remember that we can utilize a lot of these guides that have already been created and exist for us to help scaffold or to help our students understand some of these changing norms. If you're adding in some of this electronic or e-learning content, we can also provide these guides to help them know how to access them and, and use them. So on that note, some of these anytime teaching tips that go along with these resources is, first of all, uh, identifying existing content that you can share with your students. So thinking about that cognitive presence there are so many resources and so much content that already exists. You don't need to recreate the wheel here. If you don't have recorded videos or lectures or you don't have uh, content in a virtual format, content exists and you can utilize that content in a in myriad of ways. Next is sending students out to find and share. Uh, so you can actually have your students as a learning experience dive into some of these uh, databases and resources of open educational resources. Find what fits into the content of the course. Help them to curate some of these, these resources that would be helpful for the class. And then the next is actually having students create either a podcast or a libguide. Sometimes we forget that podcasts are, are such a valuable open resource. I know for me, I listen to, to a number of them uh, between the Lecture Breakers podcast or uh, the Teaching in Higher Education podcast. Those are ways that I learn from other experts in the field about teaching and, and am connected to other resources. There are so many podcasts on different topics. Have students uh, access some of those that relate to the content of your course, or even think about having them create a resource that they can share with the community. Uh, I know there's some courses who have a large service learning component where they're supposed to be out interacting with the community and, and we just can't do that during social distancing. So a podcast might be a valuable way where students can connect with uh, some resources and, and share these out to the public. All right, the second group of professionals you should be collaborating with are instructional designers. One of the things that an instructional designer might talk to you about 
is how you can adapt some of this existing content. Uh, one fantastic resource comes from our friends at the University of Central Florida. It's called Topper. It's the, the Teaching Online Pedagogical Repository. And so it has all sorts of activities and evidence-based strategies to engage your students in some of these anytime teaching or remote teaching situations. You can, you can go through, uh, identify an activity for an example that you would like, and if you can, can copy that directly into your own course, if it fits your discipline and it fits your population of students, then absolutely go for it. But also remember that we can adapt some of these things uh, to really fit the context of our own course. And on that note, we also have access to Canvas Commons. So when you log into your Canvas course, there on that, that left-hand navigation, if you look down further, uh, just below your, your calendar and your inbox, you'll see this link to Commons. And what that actually is, is a, is a repository of Canvas content. There are full courses, there are modules, there's assignments and assessments things that you can actually pull directly down into your own Canvas course. And then again, from there, you can adapt it to fit the context of your course. If it's an assignment, you can tweak it to fit the, the discipline. You can adapt the assignment to fit these remote teaching situations where students are maybe confined to, to their homes. Uh, I know for me, one of, the, one of the assignments that I used to have my students do was uh, go out into nature and and rather than than sitting in in their apartment or wherever they're at and and reviewing the content I actually wanted them to go out to a different space so we can't do that exactly now with social distancing but we can adapt it enough that that it fits that that experience of moving to a different space uh, to engage in the content that week Next, instructional designers might help you think of ways that you can incorporate writing into your course. Uh, one of the ways that is often done in an online course, uh, for example, in Canvas, is by creating a discussion forum. Uh, but as our friend uh, Jesse Stolman would point out, that creating a discussion forum does not necessarily inherently create a community, right? We often think of that, that social presence aspect of an online course really happens in the discussion forum. And it can if we create it in a way that allows students to actually interact and engage in discourse. Um, but by just creating a discussion, it doesn't create that community. So what are some ways that we can help encourage students to interact in that space? One is giving them choice or, or multiple entry points into the conversation. Rather than maybe asking a specific question, we can give students an option of questions that relate to the content that week. That really gives them an opportunity to share from their own background and experience, uh, but also gives them the option of, yeah, I would like to look at it from this angle, or I'd like to use this lens over here when I'm thinking about the content this week. And that can really drive some interesting conversations and discourse within your, within your class. Finally, uh, engaging in some of the, the learning sciences directly in your classroom, you can use writing absolutely to do that. Uh, there's this, this practice called free recall or brain dumps where you have students kind of pause, take a moment from their learning and uh, turn away from their notes and actually just write down everything they can remember about the topic at that point. That's a really great opportunity for them to engage in this retrieval practice, which we know from the learning scientists can really help students to retain information for a longer period of time. And it really encodes that into their long-term memory. Another one that I would recommend from our friend Online Course Lady is, is allowing students to start a blog. We'll get into that here in a second. These anytime teaching tips. So I'm gonna to move to C here first. She talks about this great idea of starting a blog uh, you can have students write uh, this idea of the brain dump, right? Just have them write something. Get them thinking about the topic. Get them to share that out. There's this really interesting dynamic that happens when we, when we stop just writing to our instructor or we stop just writing to our peers in a class. 
and we start writing in an open way that's open to the world. It changes the way that we, we think about our writing. Uh, back to the top, A, engage students in discussion. It's a great way to start. Uh, these anytime discussions in whether you're using Canvas or Slack or Pronto or some of these other great tools where you can allow students to interact and, and engage in discussion, help them to have those conversations and guide them in that discourse. Uh, we can also send students uh, to engage with experts on Twitter. I did this with one of my classes. Right now we have so many authors of a lot of these books that we're, we're reading and talking about in our classes that are, are sitting at home and are accessible. Oh, and it looks like I've lost my video feed. One example uh, would be our friend Josh Eiler, uh, who came and presented recently at Utah State. He has opened up uh, his calendar to do guest lectures or to, to talk with students about uh, topics that you might already be discussing in your class. But what a great opportunity to reach out to experts in the field and allow students to engage with them. It's again that idea of flattening the walls of our classroom, letting the students go out and, and reach out to uh, experts or, or, or maybe even community members and, and have some discourse and interaction there. All right, our third group are our learning analytics professionals. As you've already seen uh, in this webinar series, there are so many interesting things that we can learn from uh, learning analytics about our students and the ways in which we can use those insights in our own teaching. One really interesting uh, analysis that was done recently in our Center for Student Analytics was looking at the impact of the use of Canvas design tools and the impact that it had on, on student success uh, in the classroom. So, so in this analysis, we looked at, at individuals who had used the Canvas design tools uh, in their Canvas course as a way of intentionally designing activities. And we saw that the individuals uh, in classes where they had used these tools compared to the others that there was actually a, a significant bump or significant increase in student success based on GPA uh, for all students. But there was a, especially an impact on our first generation students. Now, this isn't inherent in the, in the tools themselves. Really what this speaks to is this idea of us being intentional in the way that we're designing and facilitating our courses. So for me, that was a really great insight to think about how I am really intentionally um, helping students to be successful in my class. Another tool that a learning analytics professional might point you towards is this workload course estimator. Uh, and what we can do with this is actually very intentionally look at the reading writing uh, assignments and exams that we're giving our students. For example, with the reading, we can identify the number of pages per week that we're asking students to read. And then we can get into some granularity we can say, you know, this is pretty dense, this is difficult material. And from our friends at Rice University who, who created this tool, it gives us an estimate of the amount of time we're actually asking our students to engage in this work outside of the classroom. Now, this is a great way to be intentional uh, and, and really have some expectations of, of what it is I'm assigning and, and how much of a burden is it going to be on my students. This also gives us a really interesting frame to think about the way that we're asking students to spend their time out of class on our classwork. Uh, this came from an idea that I heard at the Teaching for Learning conference recently from the keynote speaker. And he talked about this idea of, of Wikipedia, right? We, we hear Wikipedia a lot uh, kind of being demonized where students will only go to Wikipedia to pull from information, uh, but we don't need to think of it that way. This idea of flattening the walls of our classroom. What if some of that time that we're having students spend on assignments, we actually shifted and we had them instead going into Wikipedia and looking at the content or a topic from the course that we're talking about and have the students actually add some of the citations and resources or even make edits to the existing content so that fits right into these anytime teaching tips. There's all sorts of ways that we can engage our students. 
uh, but really focusing on being intentional in our approach. Really think through why am I, why am I giving the students this assignment? Uh, Dr. Mitch Culver, he, he's really helped me to think about that in my own class. You know, why am I assigning this writing assignment? Is it because that's what I've always done, or is there some something behind that writing assignment um, that really speaks to the student development or the things that they're learning? So just being intentional. Another is promptness and positive feedback. I'm not going to dive into that too deep because we've already heard a lot about that in this series. But really remember, be as students are submitting their work, be prompt in the way that you're giving feedback. Sometimes we, we call this feed forward instead of feedback. Giving students insights that help them to improve their work. It's this growth mindset idea of your feedback isn't the final word that you're giving them the feedback so that they can improve on what they're doing. And again, we also learned it from this series about the importance of, of framing that feedback uh, in a positive way, having positive sentiment. And then finally, consider ways for students to contribute to online resources. So we already talked about that with Wikipedia, but there are really easy ways creating Google Docs that can be shared publicly. Uh, sharing blogs or other resources on social media, ways that students can create resources and, and share them out. All right, and number four is our media production professionals. There are so many great insights that I've learned uh, from our own team here at Utah State. Ryan Christensen has been great. I love working with him and, and relying on his expertise in media to really provide the best uh, the best types of videos and the best types of media for my students. One resource that uh, Ryan pointed me to recently is this book, 99 Tips for Creating Simple and Sustainable Educational Videos uh, by Karen Costa. And, and from that, some of these things that we learn is that we can use what we have available to us, right? I'm, I'm sitting here in, in front of my computer. I'm using my headphones that have a little microphone on it. It's not fancy, right? So use what you have available to you to create videos. If it's easy to just use your phone and record a quick video, perfect. We, we don't need to be fancy. And, and along with that is uh, Karen recently uh, shared tip number 37, I think it was, on satisficing. This idea that we don't need to be perfect in the videos that we create. Uh, in fact, sometimes is just focus on <laughs> this idea of adequate results. What is going to be good enough right now in this anytime teaching, this remote teaching situation? It doesn't have to be perfect. What's going to work for your students right now and create it for them? And again, uh, this, fi this final idea on these videos is to, to reach out authentically. Uh, Dr. Culver talked about this earlier in the web series, so I won't spend too much time on it. But there were some great examples that I saw on social media uh, this past week or so from uh, the College of Ag and Applied Sciences with teachers like uh, Dr. Rood and Dr. Benninghoff who are, are reaching out to their students and just saying, hey, uh, we see you, we know that this is hard, we think it's hard too, these are some things that, that I want to give to you to, to encourage you to keep going. And, and then of course Denise Stewartson, I loved her video. She just kind of gave a check-in with her students saying, hey, you know, I, I'm reading, this is the book that I'm currently reading right now. Uh, I've been thinking about you uh, and just want to make sure that, that you know that we're working together and, and that I'm here for you, right? What great examples of just authentically reaching out to students. Uh, for the most part, they're just using a, their phone or their computer uh, camera and just making a quick video to let students know that they care. So some of these anytime teaching tips. Create these authentic videos to check in with students. It's also a helpful way to manage expectations in these anytime and remote teaching situations. Uh, as things change, as things evolve, we have to kind of adapt our expectations and be flexible with the way that we're asking our students to engage and, and helping them to understand that things are different and and that we're 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 working as best as we can given the situation another fantastic thing uh, that comes from our friend uh, Tom Tobin 
who came to USU before as part of our uh, ETE conference, is this comes from the world of Universal Design for Learning, or UDL. He talks about it in terms of plus one thinking. So what's one thing that you can add that will help the students? If it's an assignment, uh, does it need to be writing or can the students record a video? Uh, when you are recording some of these videos, are you adding captions so that students uh, can read those? And it's not just with students that might have some sort of accommodation, but there are situations, for example, um, I know for me when I was working on online courses for my master's degree, uh, sometimes I was watching videos at, at night and I was trying to keep it quiet. So I would sometimes turn on the captions uh, because I, I didn't want it to be loud enough to wake up my kids in the other room. So think about this plus one thinking. What's, what's one thing, what's one simple thing that you can add to help uh, lower barriers uh, to student success? And then finally, uh, engaging students in curating a playlist of videos for class. So this is one way you can do that within your own course, but this, this is another way to flatten the walls of the classroom. What are the, the main topics? What are the things that you've been talking about in your course uh, of content that already exists, whether it's on YouTube or elsewhere, and have your students actually create a playlist of topics of videos that fit into your course. And finally, I just wanted to talk about this book, uh, Geeky Pedagogy, that I've been reading. Uh, the author really uh, points out this idea in higher ed that a lot of us come in as content experts, but not necessarily as teaching experts. And even if we do have some teaching background and some teaching skills, uh, there's always room for us to learn and grow and improve. And uh, one of the points that she makes uh, later on in the book is she says, effective teachers never finish learning. And as long as I'm teaching, I'll have to keep figuring out how to best foster student learning. And that just resonated with me so well right now with this, this shift to online and remote teaching that we've been going through. Um, we're all trying to figure this out. Um, but the biggest point or the biggest emphasis area here is that we're trying. We're, we're making the effort and we're, we're trying to help foster student learning. I think that's so important. Because when it comes down to it, you as the instructors and all of these professionals we have at the university to help, we all care about student success. It's the heart of our institutional core goals. And we need to remember that instructors are the lifeblood. You are the lifeblood. You are the the biggest connection that our students have to the university. And the efforts that you put in are seen and they're valued. And we just really appreciate all of the things that you're doing to try to help our students right now through this time. Thank you so much for being part of this webinar. Uh, it's been really fun to be part of the Remote Teaching and Learning Analytics web series. And just keep doing what you're doing keep trying things out, reach out to the professionals that are available, and stay well.